Welcome, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, big call uh, <clears throat> event on business human rights artificial intelligence. My name is uh, Irene Pietropaoli. I'm a research leader in business human rights at um, Bicol and will be chairing this, uh, uh, this event today for the next hour and a half with our wonderful speakers. Uh, so the topic of today, business human rights artificial intelligence. Um, this is like um, a field that is uh, uh, developing um, quite rapidly, like the links between uh, these two areas. Artificial intelligence, uh, rapid development, uh, portend to the potential for machines to act and make decisions independently at this uh, transforming society. Um, artificial intelligence, big data model have already been deployed in areas of considerable human rights significance, for example, healthcare, uh, education, employment, uh, criminal justice, just to, to mention some. So th there are a number of concerns that this development is happening without appropriate regulation, safeguard, or accountability, especially from, uh, from a human rights point of view. Um, we at BICOL have, have been following this development now for, uh, for the past years and organized a number of uh, events and research projects um, about artificial intelligence regulation more generally. Of course, there are challenges that uh, artificial intelligence pose to human rights that are quite uh, that, that have been studied and addressed uh, in uh, um, in a number of uh, um, areas of work and of research and advocacy for example right to privacy freedom of expression freedom of thought security electoral fairness democracy but it seems that there is not yet a clear attention on regulation that is needed to address the overall uh, business and human rights problems. So the, the overall um, human rights challenges that are created by the business model as such. And this is a business model that is based on uh, uh, the ability to collect, store, analyze, use large amount of uh, personal data for uh, company profit. So th there are um, proposals um, to use actually the business human rights framework to address this, uh, um, this business model. The business human rights phrase will, of course, refer in, 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 uh, in particular to the UN Guiding Principle on Business Human Rights. The international community has agreed upon a framework of guiding principle to prevent, respect, and remedy human rights arms that are related to business conduct. Um, the, the UN Guiding Principle were endorsed um, more than 10 years ago, in 2011. Since then, then a number of countries and also more recently, the European Commission have either passed or proposed legislation that establish mandatory corporate human rights due diligence. And at the same time, also at the European level, there are proposals to establish regulation on artificial intelligence. So today, uh, we will examine the, um, the, the, the artificial intelligence a regulation within this business human rights framework and also the concept of uh, human rights due diligence, whether it is possible somehow to apply this to the emerging um, artificial intelligence based business model. How? Um, so, broadly, um, as the business human rights framework is divided into these three concepts the protect, respect, and remedy. Uh, so the state duty to protect human rights, for example, through regulation, the corporate responsibility to respect and also access to remedy. Um, we have uh, three uh, speakers that will uh, cover those, uh, uh, those area. And, uh, um, and with that, I actually start with the, with the first. Uh, Daria Unito, um, she's a research associate at Edinburgh Law School. And that she is investigating modes of informal and formal governance regarding autonomous system. Um, her background is in international European law. Uh, she's doing research on the future of artificial intelligence regulation, in particular focusing on the connection between technical safeguard and human rights standard to govern these uh, novel technologies. Um, so she will uh, um, present now. So I guess, uh, Daria, um, um, as you know, you have done quite a lot of research on this. Could you tell us about um, how, how will you compare the UN Guiding Principle and the uh, Artificial Intelligence Act 
framework, especially at the European Union level, to, to, to address the, the impact of, uh, of artificial intelligence system. Yes, so I think, yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting time to do that, considering the, um, the new development of the EU Commission's proposal of the AI Act, as well as the relevance um, and the renewed relevance of the UN guiding principles um, to address um, um, gaps with regard to AI governance. Um, and I think to offer, like, it's important to offer a bit of background why these two developments are so significant and why we need a combination of those to address the risks effectively. So I think when we consider the proliferation of AI technologies to classify and predict future behavior, such as defining social media content or informed custodial decisions, to name a few, we are often concerned to define um, the tangible and intangible impact of these tools shaping human dignity as well as values of autonomy and human rights. And this is an issue that has been recognized quite a while ago, such as by in 2019 by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who said that digital systems and artificial intelligence create centers of power and unregulated centers of power always pose risk, risks. And we need a universal response in defense of universal uh, human rights. And what this shows effectively is that we need a preventative approach to ad address the risks of AI systems, which can be done based on the articulation of common principles, such as restating and recontextualizing um, the universal value of human rights in the big data age. Um, another development is that we don't only consider um, that we need a common uh, perspective on how to assess harm in a strict sense, sense, but there's also a need for a framework which can deal with multiple actors and non-state actors on the international plane, and which can encompass the regulation of the entire algorithmic life cycle, including the design of these systems. And here we see a huge proliferation of uh, approaches how, can, how this can be done in practice, such as technical standards, ethical standards, as well as soft law approaches, many of which were initially initiated uh, by tech companies themselves. But we see now how these also transcend um, intergovernment and governmental perspectives. So for example, a good uh, is the transparency in the human oversight safeguards in the AI Act, which also refer to the statement by the AI high level expert groups, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, or on the other side of the spectrum, the requirements of algorithmic audits when we consider the new US Algorithmic Accountability Act too. And all these notions are actually to achieve trustworthy AI, human-centric AI, as well as other important values such as fairness. So, um, so an important consequence, what I, uh, I mentioned is that, what I intend to highlight is that we intend to focus more on the interactive experience of AI now to strengthen um, human rights values. And it's, we are not only concerned anymore with the strict automation um, of AI to achieve certain tasks, but how does it relate to the user? So recognizing this uh, contextual outlook, we can make some general points about the EU Commission's proposal for the AI Act and the uh, UN guiding principles. So focusing on the AI Act, that is argued to illustrate one of the most influential regulatory steps internationally. And a contextual perspective shows that it's, pro that it's initially it's intended to provide safe and secure products certified for the EU market. So it is not about regulating information asymmetries or corporate power as such, um, such as big tech giants like Google or uh, Amazon, whereby we would have to look at other regulatory safeguards such as the digital, uh, GDPR or the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. So what the AI Act does is it's providing a risk-based approach to the regulation of AI systems, out of which the proposal is most concerned, arguably, with high-risk systems, um, which are either intended 
um, to be used as a safety component of a product such as medical device or as well as areas um, stipulated in Annex 3, such as automated hiring software for employment. So in practice, what it does, it establishes a range of requirements uh, of essential requirements for providers, ranging from data quality, technical documentation, record keeping, transparency and human oversight, as well as robust, robustness, accuracy and security for high risk systems. Users are also mentioned in the proposal, but it does not refer to the end user as such, but rather pertains to the individual using the AI system under its authority, such as the employer or the local authority. So much, so much about the success of this AI Act will depend on the provider to mitigate those high risks and communicate those residual risks um, to the user, unless the user substantially modifies the system. So if we look at the UN guiding principles on the other act, um, we can see that this could be an effective complementary tool to assess and address um, some concerns of AI technologies. So what is the role of the UN guiding principles? It can, opera, opera, um, it can provide a holistic approach um, to, um, to channel the performance of state obligations under the um, framework and if the state is also required to protect individuals from harm by third parties, including corporations. And in principle 15 also establishes that business enterprises themselves respect human rights by undertaking ongoing human rights diligence um, and to address actual uh, and potential impacts of human rights. So what it does, it establishes a holistic framework in articulating certain norms and expectations um, for states and businesses and which can apply to the full life cycle of algorithmic systems. Um, I guess an important development in this direction is that there are also calls to make certain demanded uh, to establish a mandat mandat mandatory due diligence obligation. So, um, in this respect, there are documents by the Big Data and Society and the European Center for Not-Profit in Law, um, as well as the Councils of Views Ad Hoc Committee on AI. They highlight that we need a uniform model to assess those complementary uh, responsibilities. So what follows from these approaches is that we see two aims, which is that we need to ensure the systems con uh, an AI systems continuous deployment on the ground to protect an individual's safety, but also maintain um, algorithmic functionality, which can have an impact as well on fundamental rights and human dignity. But also we need the alignment, um, uh, AI technologies alignment to values of accountability and responsibility, which to a certain extent, or certainly entails the rights-based approach to AI governance. And future calls and efforts need to consider to bring these two values together in order to safeguard um, innovation, but also to provide the appropriate means of legal certainty. Thank you. <laughs> Daria, thank you very much. That's, that, that's so interesting. Definitely, it's so important uh, to look at this uh, alignment between the, this, this uh, regulation that are developing at the moment seem, seem still quite independently uh, in, in, in the area of uh, business human rights and uh, in artificial intelligence and in, in particular um, um i have just like a follow-up question also just for the audience any question that you have please uh, use the question and answer um box and uh, like the last 20 minutes half an hour of of this event will uh, uh, will uh, dedicate it to, um, uh, to answer those um but i would just um wondering um if uh, um you can um uh, maybe explain a bit more uh, um, how you think that uh, um, human rights due diligence can address some issues within the, the Artificial Intelligence Act, and in particular, whether you think that um, the concept of human rights due diligence can help to specify what harm uh, of AI technology uh, means. I think one, one important um... I'm going to speak less this time. Uh, so one important uh, aspect is that um, it would apply irrespective of the technology. 
So it would require a proactive um, um, assessment of all possible harms where it has not exhaustive, but it's an important obligation to consider um, conduct um, as well, not only the systems intended use and performance specifications. So that is an important um, lack uh, gap of the AI Act that a lot of is a lot of um, uh, requirements are put on the provider and with regard to the systems intended use. In addition, it also um, considers the aspect of impact on the individual. So there needs to be a much, much more consideration how these tools affect the individual as well as key vulnerable groups, which has been also uh, mentioned in UN uh, documents that it requires specific engagement with key vulnerable groups. So this kind of the rights-based approach um, can inform um, um, ex-ante um, control, but also post-market um, um, assessments through um, engaging with users' perspectives and individual perspectives. And because it's an iterative process and a continuous process, it can inform um, quite um, well the um, in alignment with the AI Act. Yeah. Thank you, Daria. I have um, some uh, some other questions for you, but we'll uh, we'll go back to to that in uh, in a bit. But I um, um, just want to um, give now space to to our next speaker, um, Gayatri uh, Kanadai, um, and she's actually joined um, us today from uh, from Mauritius. Um, so she's the head of technology and human rights. A business human rights resource center. She had just joined uh, the resource center in, um, in February this year. Um, but Gayatri is a lawyer with a background in international law and human rights, also the international human rights um, regional uh, system. Um, before joining the business human rights resource center, she worked. Uh, with national and regional human rights uh, group. She she's, uh, uh, was based in India until recently, been focusing on uh, especially freedom of expression. Um, so she was also actually the Asia Pacific, um, Asia Policy Regional Coordinator at the Association for Progressive Communication, where uh, her focus was on uh, judicial rights and policy in Asia, with emphasis on uh, freedom of expression, religion, Freedom Assembly and Association on the Internet Social like Bust experience of that. But um, um, today, as I mentioned, we are now moving to like the, the second pillar uh, of the business human rights framework, which is more the actual responsibility of, of company. Um, so um, Gayatri, tell us please um, um, about the human rights responsibility of company that are developing and, uh, and deploying artificial intelligence systems. Thank you, but uh, first I just must say that I'm having a little bit of a tech issue, so I'm sorry if my audio or video doesn't quite um, keep up. Um, thank you for organizing this discussion. It's been fantastic to listen to Daria on the AI Act and the applicability of the UN guiding principles to AIs. This is a critical conversation given the standard setting role played by Europe, uh, the UN GPs, um, as was pointed out, are a good and reliable framework to assess and guide the development, deployment, and governance of AI. Um, it is important that AI and the businesses or other entities that are developing them are guided by international norms. Um, the discussions around ethics has, has sort of helped uh, bring together different actors to have the important conversations um, but I must say that the UNGPs, however, cements these conversations together to hold these entities accountable. It provides a good framework um, for um, companies. It provides a good framework for um, Gaia. I think we lost uh, we lost your audio. I think you are. Uh... You may have uh, muted yourself. Yeah, Sorry, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I just had to fix my. Um, yeah, no worries. For a second, yeah, like I was saying, um, while the conversations around ethics have been extremely helpful in bringing different actors together 
to have conversations that would have otherwise been difficult. I feel that the UNGPs has brought a really good framework um, that all actors can rely on to hold each other accountable. Uh, the impact of AIs and the benefits sought from them are undeniable. But what is important is the recognition that um, either the impact or the benefit of these are not restricted to the tech sector. Increasingly, companies across several sectors are using AI to make critical decisions, especially those undertaken in the name of efficiency have a significant impact on workers' rights. And therefore, there needs to be a greater conversation and understanding around AIs, um, not just among the tech sector, but actually with these other actors and their stakeholders. Um, I feel that the first step towards this is understanding what businesses are trying to do with the AI and that they're developing. Um, this needs to happen by having more information and analysis, enabling and actively seeking engagement from actors who are not tied to these businesses, such as external experts from civil society, feminist groups, people who have expertise in governance of technology and the tech community itself is important to the process of ensuring that human rights are built into AI from the beginning um, in the sense that they come along at, at all stages, the design, the development, the deployment, all of this, rather than having to go back and trying to undo a foundational error. I mean, AI and uh, consequential actions that harm users impact the trust that users or consumers have impacting ultimately the brand of the business and potentially leading to expensive and extensive legal financial losses and, and legal entanglements to be more clear. Um, to ensure that AI that is developed by businesses is human rights respecting, I would think that the place to start with would be ensuring that the work culture at the workplace and extension of that workplace are human rights respecting, that there's sort of a culture of rights. Um, if the work place that is developing the AI or its operations are riddled with casteism, racism, oppression, sexual harassment, gender discrimination, it is very unlikely that the products that they are going to put out are going to be drastically different. Um, and guidance on improving compliance and integrating human rights into the foundation of AI can be found in different sources, including the Toronto Declaration. But my suspicion is that if companies more intentionally convene conversations on rights and AI, many of these points may come up organically. And it's not just about AIs. I think it's important for companies to have more conversations internally in, in safe spaces that they feel that they can have an honest conversation around about generally the products and the impact that in, the human rights impact it has on different populations. Um, and in addition to, I, I'm going to digress a little bit, in addition to what businesses are doing, um, perhaps it's, it's also important to look at what states are doing and, uh, in relation to AI. Predominantly, especially in the global south, companies are being contracted to develop and execute huge tech undertaking for, for governance. Um, states must exercise an, 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 a great deal of caution when they're doing this and make sure that thorough assessments are carried out and that a degree of monitoring is maintained. States must also ensure that the contracted businesses are able to give clear explanations about the data that went into developing the AI, the process, the results, and the decision making. Um, Another part of the state's responsibility, therefore, would be the regulation aspect of it. It's important that, that private sector, along with many other stakeholders, work with the government to ensure that the regulation that's going to be put in place from the very beginning is rights respecting and it works for all parties involved, rather than having to go back and fix something that is quite much harder to do. Now, coming back to businesses, um, I would think that communicating in an accessible way about AI as such, the data, the decisions made, the repercussions, et cetera, is needed and perhaps is currently lacking a little bit. Um, hiding behind sort of the complexity of the technology may not be helpful in the long run. Um, I guess the alternative would be that if we are going to continue saying that AI is too complex to be explained in a certain way, the alternative perhaps would be something that the pharma industry is, is subjected to, which is to essentially have a regulator check your products or check your AI, give you the permission to execute it. And I'm not sure that's a, that's a road that 
that uh, we want to go down. Um, even from a user's perspective, um, it's the bare minimum for them to expect um, to know what data it is about them that, that these companies have and what is the process, what was the thinking that went into a particular decision-making process and what was the basis on which that decision was made and what is it that I can do if I'm unhappy with the results of it or if I feel that I've been harmed by it. But to do this kind of communication, businesses need to first, um, or rather I would say it's imperative that the businesses conduct a well-designed and executed human rights due diligence with the participation of stakeholders, and, and, and I mean stakeholders beyond what would be obvious in an open and, and participatory manner. Uh, in addition to due diligence by the businesses themselves, it's also important that other ecosystems that are connected to these businesses also do their own analysis. For instance, it's important that investors and companies start doing their own assessments to understand and be informed about the impact that the businesses that they're investing in have. Well, these investors and their analysis can, of course, draw from the human rights due diligence conducted by these businesses. Um, recently, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center published a guide um, that focused on navigating the surveillance ecosystem for investors. The fundamental framework of this guide can well be extended to AI, and I've shared the link with, with Irene, and, and, and I'm happy to share the link again in chat. I think that the foundational framework of this guide can also be extended to AI. And if there is interest in exploring the possibility of doing that, I will be more than happy to meet with you and discuss this further. Another important aspect that I referred to earlier is participation. One of the key focus of the resource center is accountability of businesses and advocacy around this. We do this by communicating with businesses about allegations of human rights violations, we would like to continue seeing more responses from the tech sector, especially the larger players, whom national and other civil society actors have sometimes found to be a challenge in terms of getting the responses or communication. Ensuring that remedy is available, that the businesses are willing to address um, harm and if necessary, stop or halt the AI that have been deployed on account of this harm or violation is critical. However, I would like to close um, with one particular issue for us to bear in mind. Businesses that are developing AI currently are doing so at a time when a significant population of the world remains unconnected to the, to the digital world, to the internet. So therefore, the, the AI, the data that they are basing the AI on, be it data-based machine learning or deep learning, um, this is happening without the participation of a significant population, without the participation of the unconnected. When the unconnected do make it over, it may well be that the decisions that are being made for them would have been based on, on things that have nothing to do with their realities without taking their realities into account. And that is something that is, is scary and businesses should definitely bear in mind. Thank you, thank you, Gladys. This is um, again really fascinating, especially like your uh, I mean, like your 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 inside of actually what's um, what's happening in uh, in the global south and this uh, point, of course, of about like, development happening so quickly, but without taking account really such a large part of uh, a population. And um, so, yeah, Business Human Rights Resource Center is doing um, interesting work in this area, just like. Um, Add the, the 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 link to the to the brief that you just mentioned, uh, and uh, I see that there are some questions people with their hand raised. So we will uh, uh, we will uh, give space to the audience uh, at the end of the of the event. But uh, just and uh, Gaia, if I can just ask like a, a quick um, follow up question. Um, Maybe you can uh, tell us uh, a bit more also uh, based on your experience and the work of the resource center. What do you think are really like the concrete steps that business can uh, uh, can take in this uh, in this area? No, thanks, Irene. I think you know the steps that the businesses should take would of course depend on what stage they are in terms of the AI development. But what would be helpful is to provide a set of questions that like an initial set of questions for companies to think about, businesses to think about. 
um, for them to ask themselves whether there is a clear understanding of what the human rights based approach is, at least among the people who are closely involved in the development and deployment of the AI. Is it rights respecting by design? What are the rights that are sought to be furthered by the development of this AI or parts of it at least? And are some of the rights negatively impacted by this AI? Who are the groups that will benefit from this AI? And who will be left behind? And who's going to be negatively impacted? At least having that understanding of, of that. I mean, it's not black and white, but at least having a broad understanding of that. And then looking at, does the AI seek to tap into aspects of the user's life that the user wants to keep private? Does it seek to manipulate or influence their independent thinking? Um, do those who are negatively impacted by this, this AI have the ability and access to remedy? Is it clear to them that there is a mechanism and a process to access the remedy? Beyond the evident rights, um, are there other rights that, that, they, that they should be thinking about? For instance, are they thinking about environmental impact of the, of the AI and the company's operations? Um, positive, whether there's a positive impact of, of the AI on, on, on the environment, similarly on the right to benefit from scientific development, whether their business model, does it make it less possible for users to be able to benefit from scientific development? And last would be, does the intended user understand what decision was made? Why and how? I mean, just answering some of these basic questions will perhaps help them decide what steps is it that they need to take. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm interesting. I, um, hopefully, business. If there are also some in the audience, can really take this as a, as a as a guidance, and there's probably need for uh, more guidance actually on this. Uh, um, on this point, but uh, we'll go back to uh, to some of this issue in uh, in a moment. But um, just now, I want to move to uh, our um, third wonderful uh, speaker that is uh, Sidem Chimri, and she's uh, she's a lawyer and a business human rights advisor uh, with um, actually quite a lot of expertise in 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 other sectors as well in the garment textile. A food automobile industry that just been uh, working on a number of uh, projects on that, but she's also the co-founder and chairperson of a new um, NGO like called the Minerva Business Human Rights Association, that is the first Turkish NGO that has a central focus on, uh, on business human rights. Um, she's also been advising the UNICEF, UNDP, ILO on uh, responsible business practice and, um, and human rights. And uh, she also was the Turkey country lead at the Center for uh, Child Rights and Business, where uh, she coordinated the implementation of child labor uh, related problems. So, quite like a vast experience. And um, I think, Sidam, um, uh, you can really um, maybe offer us some different uh, point of view. Um, in particular, do you think that uh, um, artificial intelligence, since we often discuss just the negative impact, but do you think that there can be also some positive impacts in the issue of business human rights, for example, as the potential to increase supply chain transparency and enable greater corporate accountability? Um, thank you, Irene, and thanks for your invitation. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, being here. Um, and um, straight answer, yes, I do think that technology promises to shed light on what have become highly complex production networks uh, globally. Um, most of the time, um, this complexity of supply chains hinders companies and their suppliers as well as human rights groups and civil societies uh, and even governments to go beyond uh, second tiers. Um, many layers of the supply chains of labor intensive industries are being left out uh, or the accurate way to put this is their subcontractors or labor or sorry, sourcing agents um, usually limit the corporate oversight uh, for, for human rights conditions uh, in production areas. Um, in garment uh, workshops or on the farms. Um, so this also prevents truthful supply chain mapping because we could not, there is an opacity 
in terms of supply chain mapping. And uh, therefore, it's difficult to do conduct human rights risk assessments, uh, which are indispensable steps of human rights due diligence. Um, most of the time, human rights groups try to fill the gaps by revealing adverse impacts of business activities. For example, take Amnesty International's research on how migrant workers are being exploited in uh, during building stadium for, uh, for World Cup in Qatar. Uh, they had found modern slavery-like practices, which include expensive recruitment fees, appalling living conditions, withholding of salaries, passport conf confiscations, which are very common uh, among uh, migrant worker exploitation practices and threats by employers, uh, which make it very hard for migrant workers to leave their jobs and return to their home countries. Um, during its investigation, Amnesty had only uh, managed to collect representative data as it had only contract contacted a very limited number of workers, which is understandable because they had to operate under the radar uh, by being extra careful and cautious to not to create additional risks for migrant workers and for themselves um, and they therefore they they were able to uh, supply uh, and get more uh, confidential information about the supply chain um, from frankly from a human rights perspective I do think that their data is solid enough uh, amnesty's amnesty's data is solid enough to prove that there are abuses faced by migrant workers in Qatar Nevertheless, uh, the, the government of Qatar uh, rejected Amnesty's assertion and in a statement which I took from the Guardian uh, article, it said Amnesty failed to document a single story from among 250,000 workers. As you can see, analog or static way of collecting data can be used and relied on, but it can be easily refuted by interlocutors, such as governments or companies. Uh, despite a range of ongoing efforts, corporate accountability, corporate human rights accountability, let's be very specific, um, to date rests upon or often dependent on very limited number of data. Um, we should not also forget about how human rights defenders or civil society actors put their lives on risk while collecting data in human rights violations related investigations. Maybe we can come back to that later. Um, what I want to argue now is a uh, human rights group can and should appeal the assistance of artificial intelligence technology, which can combine expert systems with deep learning algorithms as it is capable of extracting dynamic real-time insights into human behavior and relationships by um, analyzing massive amounts of publicly available and unstructured uh, data from the internet. Um, the AI technology can enable NGOs, human rights defenders, activists, and even companies themselves, provided that they are sincerely interested in seeing what's really going on on their supply chains. And this technology can confirm and connect the dots uh, in fragmentation of labor relations and supply chains. Uh, therefore, the type of information uh, that these technologies can generate um, will provide a foundation for enabling corporate accountability for human rights. So in short, I do think AI has the potential to increase supply chain transparency and enable corporate accountability, but algorithms required for this purpose is expensive very expensive and therefore they are not practically accessible by stakeholders um, appealing data analytics using big, big data applications necessitates uh, considerable funding at the moment thank you thank you Tiancy. this is such um uh, yeah, such a, such a point that is uh, um, really not often um, addressed, you know, so uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for sharing that. And uh, I, I'm wondering actually um, if you can tell us a bit more what you think are the benefit of uh, artificial intelligence technology, particularly for, uh, for human rights defenders, as you, as you mentioned mm. that. Um, 
I should start by recalling the, the report of a uh, working group on business and human rights submitted to UN Human Rights Council last year. I'm, I'm a bit, uh, it's a bit confusing after COVID to remember the dates of reports and submission dates, but it was last year. And the report was focusing on um, human rights defenders and how they are increasingly facing reprisals from, for their efforts. Uh, and uh, it, 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 that those efforts are on the way to draw attention to negative uh, business related uh, human rights impacts or human rights violations. Um, I should also emphasize the latest data announced by the Resource Center. Uh, it was actually tweeted yesterday that the Resource Center had recorded 615 attacks against human rights defenders, raising concerns about business operation in 2021. Uh, this is very serious, uh, disturbing and scary, uh, also as, a, uh, as, a, as an NGO person. Um, but we all agree on the fact that civil society actors and human rights defenders play the key role in the human rights due diligence process in the remediation aspect of uh, uh, under the UN guiding principles of human rights. And uh, all in all, in enabling companies to understand the concerns of affected stakeholders, such as local communities or workers in the lower tiers. Um, we, I think we also all agree on the fact that in order to increase supply chain transparency and corporate accountability for human rights purposes, more supply chain data is required. We should not only think about garment or its supply chain, such data is needed for every sector, include, including the technology sector itself, right? And holding companies accountable can only become more possible when sufficient, credible, accurate, and more comprehensive data on the work life, on the impacts, uh, and regarding the supply chain act actors is collected. Um, civil society actors uh, and human rights defenders can navigate better, inform better, monitor and track better, respond better, if they have the information that the AI technology can generate, provided that the privacy related regulations and upcoming AI related regulations are uh, being complied with. But ultimately, they can hold companies or human rights defenders or the civil society actors ultimately can hold companies accountable. They can guide them by voicing the stakeholders' concerns in, in the invisible layers of the supply chain. And, um, and they will not be facing with more with reprisal risks. Um, but as I have emphasized before, that these technologies are not affordable by the civil society actors. Uh, at the moment. <laughs> yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Zidane. So just, uh, just I passed in. I will, um, I will also post now um, uh, the report that uh, you just mentioned by Business uh, Human Rights Resource Center and. Uh, um, we we'll just uh, um, now uh, going back um, to what we discussed at first. You know, since uh, we've seen like some 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 example, and uh, it would be good actually, Daria, if uh, we could go back a little bit to um, like the regulation uh, point of view. And uh, um, do you think like um, what are the uh, problems? If you see any problem with with a potential mandatory human rights due diligence obligation in the European Union Act, if you think that that's something that is feasible at all and how that will, uh, will work. I, th I think the main problem would be that, um, first of all, it is a methodology. So um, it will, it's not a tool you can simply implement um, and take a broad brush approach and you el el eliminate all human rights. Uh, violations as uh, violations. So it requires uh, robust processes and specifications, which are context specific and may require also context specific solutions to the technology in question. So I think one 
So what, one issue would be to set down uh, requirements for safeguards um, and uh, process-based measures. So for example, the European Council um, would, uh, has said if, um, if an AI system has been deployed by a public authority or a private entity, um, and there are certain um, adverse impacts, that technology should be stopped and taken out um, from, from the cycle. But to make it uh, practicable in practice, there needs to be more specification in what does this requirement entail in, um, ex in technical documentation requirements, um, how does how has the user how does the user need to be informed about any potential risks? What kind of safeguards are there to deal with these risks, and how are these monitored? So you need a lot of requirements with regard to that, and with regard to the AI Act, you also need a scaling approach. So you need a nuanced scaling approach, and how do you apply these impact assessments to? high risk systems, but also how do you decide on um, also prohibited practices, but also, um, also minimal risk systems. So the idea is to identify and specify any goals and processes that can be scaled up based on that risk classification. Um, and I, I mean, in my opinion, there's this um, BSAR guidance, which um, is a bit older, but they ask a lot of um, interesting questions in how to establish certain contextual vulnerabilities. So specifying who is affected, how serious are the impacts, and what are the safeguards um, to address this. And that brings me also to another point, which is quite important and quite um, uh, missing in, in the AI Act, which is that of independent uh, independent oversight. So you do need that external independent oversight and scrutiny um, to establish conformity and compliance with a human, um, um, human rights-based approach. And you need that uh, multidisciplinary engagement and resources to engage with uh, relevant stakeholders. Um, and uh, what is uh, quite important as well, which has been mentioned um, is uh, transparency and public access and possibility of appeal. So I think uh, uh, what has been already uh, mentioned a lot is that there is a lack of remedy and uh, individual rights claiming within the AI Act. And especially if you want to continue further and respect fundamental rights and incorporate a human, uh, human, impact, a human rights impact assessment, you need that avenue um, and those impact assessments need to be transparent so an individual can refer to these and use that also as evidence that might be also quite interesting. So these are the points uh, the, the, um, I think that need to be specified to make uh, this approach um, future proof, uh, but also not watered down and too flexible um, for the future. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Agree. Thank you very much, Daria. And actually, on, on something that you mentioned, the issue of uh, independent oversight, I, I would like to go back to, uh, to Gayatri, to her, um, from her. Um, if you see, um, um, you know, what, uh, what's your opinion on like, this like, reliance on corporate self-regulation, uh, code of conduct, um, oversight bodies that uh, we have seen like a number of, uh, of company, of course, like uh, Meta, Facebook, as uh, just one example of having like kind of their own uh, oversight bodies. Is, is, is that something that you see as a, as a positive step or, like, or do we need something, something else, something different? Well, um, I think I definitely that's a positive step. It's a sign that um, that these companies are willing to take the steps that are needed to move towards a more human rights respecting um, digital ecosystem. But in my opinion, I feel that it's not really possible to escape regulation um, and it's going to happen. Regulation is going to happen one way or another. So it's much better to have um, open and honest conversation about what's workable and what's not. Um, so that we don't end up with a regulation that is essentially arbitrary, that 
governments can use when needed um, against parties that they want to use it against. Um, so I, I, I don't I don't think that one, these are mutually exclusive. Um, these are these are sort of tracks that need to exist in parallel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Gayatri. And uh, um, finally, I, I just want to ask an additional question to see them, and then we can uh, uh, open the, the floor to a question from, from the audience. But um, as um, also you, you were telling me that you also act as, as the national project manager at, at um, um, a project called like giving refugee a, a voice. So um, that was uh, funded by a uh, foundation of a government brand. So uh, tell us a bit more about how you integrated an artificial intelligence technology in, uh, uh, in this project. And also if you can share some, uh, some of your, uh, your findings, that would be interesting. Sure. Um, so let me start by our departure point, point. Um, and it was the fact that uh, there was very limited uh, number of information that uh, is available regarding the working conditions of Syrians and other refugees working in Turkey. Um, by the way, we ran this project back in 2017, uh, so it was five years ago, um, and when during the project we had identified that Actually, before the project, uh, that we 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 had identified that there there the surveys that uh, do exist uh, cover a very uh, small percentage of refugees and were either topic focused or looking at the living conditions in a very very broader terms. Um, there has been no tool available uh, to go beyond statistics, and some of the statistics were not reliable. Um, and um, and it was impossible to really uh, hear the voices of the refugees. That's why we name, or the the project is named as giving refugees a voice. And so we brought the technology in use, and we managed to capture their voices in real time and over time. Um, so we used a technology company software. Uh, to search and collect publicly available data on social networks such as Facebook, Twitter, etc. by going uh, over publicly, I'm just saying publicly available social media posts um, of refugee workers, employers and labor intermediaries. Um, our search was sifted through 219,000 profiles, 4.4 million public posts and found at least 52,000 unregistered Syrian workers active in Turkey's garment supply chain. Um, actually, the project, uh, the project was able to collect data from unlimited span of time. As I said, we, we captured the voices in real time and over time, uh, which is kind of groundbreaking because we also know that some companies are using other digital tools such as apps or you know hotlines and those digital tools are dependent on the uh, workers or their stakeholders uh, response. But this was not the case um, because um, we could, uh, by using this, um, this tool, AI tool, uh, actually we, we get gathered all sorts of information and those information are actually authentic. Uh, it was not manipulated by interviewer or auditor. Um, and uh, some information or, or some social media posts uh, or also included a video or photo which enabled us to visualize the workshops, like sweatshops, the sweatshop setting. And, um, and uh, so that, that's also one of the other factors which, uh, which makes our data very authentic. And the information uh, in short, anyway, so I'm, I'm just going to keep it short. In short, due to time, human resources, and financial limitations of the project, we had to limit our focus only to Istanbul, and which is the biggest production area in, uh, for garment sector in Turkey. So it was, again, by its nature, very challenging to verify some location tagged over the posts, because 
we are finding a relevant, for example, child labor related social media po post. And then there was this location tag over it. And we, ha we had the chance to go and verify. We did for some workshops, but some of them actually did, did not exist at all. Uh, so um, the data we had collected was significant and I think adequate to track whole supply chain uh, as well as its actors, working conditions such as wages, uh, working hours. However, data analysis is very much needed uh, to identify patterns and locations, the hubs for uh, you know, re refugee workers. And AI technology has the potential to reveal certain fact factories supplying multiple brands and working conditions of such factory but additional analysis would be needed to establish exactly which brand's product was on the lines uh, at that time and how they should or the brands should share the responsibility for human rights violations if there is a white violation identified in that uh, workshop um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, unfortunately, the report is not publicly available, as you said, that was uh, conducted uh, for a foundation uh, and they wanted to keep it confidential. So it's difficult to you know, share the data, but it, it was groundbreaking and the data that we captured was incredible. Uh, it was beyond auditing uh, scope and it, it, it was very interesting what we had found. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for um, for sharing this. Um, really interesting. Um, I think, I mean, I, I have like, of course, a few a few more questions, but uh, um, let's just maybe first give some uh, space to the audience. Of course, you can use the chat or the question and answer box. And uh, we already have a few questions. Um, so there is one from Chippy that uh, I think in particular was, was addressed to uh, was following like um, see the presentation, but actually I think uh, we can all um, answer that is about the cost. So uh, you say like on the cost expense point, uh, don't cloud enable an open source system at the cost grammatically less now, and like also related to that to that to the extent the cost is a barrier. Would actually collaboration or consortia is possible to enhance uh, transparency and, and accountability? I don't know, see them or also uh, Daria and uh, Gayatri, please. Yeah, I think it was, as I said, we conducted this project uh, back in two, 2017. Uh, probably till then, prices are get, get you know, it, it, they are lower. But again, for a civil society, I'm looking at the, this topic from a civil society perspective, and it's very difficult for human rights defenders, activists, or any civil society actors to afford it. And probably MSIs have more funding, or they can uh, secure more funding from their donors because they're international organizations. But at the end of the day, local NGOs are more on the field and they know the culture, they know the nature of the supply chains, whichever that they are, you know, looking for human rights violations. So um, we also need to get some uh, of the funding that is available if, if, if we can find, of course. Um, and um, I hope I, I could answer your question. Uh, could you, could an executive summary be made available? Unfortunately not, but uh, we, uh, we, we made a, a presentation um, in, in Santa Clara back in, again, 2017. Uh, I can maybe share the link of that um, paper uh, to, uh, I can send the paper to Irene and maybe she can post it on the website when this recording becomes available. But thanks for your question. Yes, thank you. And just uh, also reminded that we will have a video recording available on the website and also material that has been uh, uh, discussed will also be uh, there. I don't know if, if uh, Daria or uh, Gariati want to also make uh, any, any comment on this point of, 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 of the cost and the uh, possible collaboration. <clears throat> Yeah.
Yeah, um, I, I would uh, rather focus on the question of human dignity because uh, uh, yeah. the cost then uh, that's... Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, I will so, yeah that, <laughs> we have we have a question from Mike. Say uh, if you actually that um, I think it's addressed to to all of you. If you can say more about uh, uh, human human dignity in the context of artificial intelligence application and algorithm governance. Yeah, so uh, from my perspective, um, human dignity is well. It's all so it's uh, uh, it's the essence. Um, how we consider uh, human rights obligations, such as um, privacy, uh, but also data protection. But it goes further than that and can also address structural issues. So how we design technology based on values of inclusion, um, diversity, but also respecting um, um, needs of when we have, if we consider no new emerging technologies such as social robots in healthcare and uh, interacting with people who are disabled, and so on. But more interesting will be the um, will be the discussion, in my opinion, whether based on that on the value of human dignity, we have to consider whether there are certain probabilistic approaches that are not acceptable in certain uses and use cases. And we had already a starting point of this discussion with regard to facial recognition software uh, in public places by, by the police that these should be completely banned by the act. But I'm also thinking about um, not necessarily banned, but uh, how do we deal with certain safety critical uh, systems such as AI, uh, medical AI and healthcare. And what does it mean to, in, to maintain certain values of human dignity and autonomy when those systems operate on the ground? So that is still a, quite a, a discussion that is, um, it's, it's starting, but it will be quite important to, in my opinion, to think about these questions in order to move on from the uh, from um, seeing the system as a um, subject of performance and a system that is interact to a system that is interacting uh, with the user, such as a patient, and for example, giving diagnostic uh, advice on treatments and diagnostics. So yes, that is my opinion on that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Darian. Uh, Gaia, did you want to add something on, on this? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a really important question about talking about when we say human rights, what are we talking about? Um, how exactly does AI impact human rights? I think sometimes we just assume that we're all on the same, uh, on the same page when we're talking about human rights and, and AI. So it's important that we go back and talk about those basics because dignity is inherently at the center of human rights. Dignity, non-discrimination, choice, these are sort of foundational concepts that define um, human rights. Therefore, it's not a question of dignity versus human rights. It, it's a part of each other. That there is no way we can ensure dignity of people if, if their other rights are not guaranteed. Um, similarly, there's no question of, of, of uh, guaranteeing human rights if dignity is not at the center of that discussion. Um, like, let's take, for instance, right? If a particular kind of AI is developed where darker skinned women or women who are not a particular size or do not fit the notion of how a particular woman should look or how, uh, 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 or how a particular person should look, right? What, what would then happen is that there would be delays in, in, um, in their data being, vali uh, being validated, in them kind of being chosen for certain things. And as a result, they would be discriminated. And then another example would be those that are obviously connected to privacy, which is that there are parts of my life that I choose to keep private. When the AI is built to dig into those nodes of my life and pick out those um, sort of information about me, which I have not intentionally shared with the company for the purpose of further uh, processing, what would happen is that, let's say, for example, sex, my sexuality, which I may not have wanted to become a part of decisions being made on me. Um, 
that is a violation of privacy. Then there are questions around right to education, right to access to different services. All of these can get affected if AI, if AI is not designed in a human rights compliant manner. Therefore, the discussion is, is about centering human rights, which in itself is centered around dignity. Thank you, thank you. This is so important to, to always keep that in, in mind, you know, the, 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 the human rights, the human dignity uh, framework, because that's what we are we're talking about, actually. And uh, there is, a, there is um, also a very relevant uh, question from ECMA, um, as we, we discuss those sometimes two separate issues of uh, the regulation that is developing in the artificial intelligence field and the one that is developing in the business human rights, in addition to legislation on mandatory corporate human rights due diligence, of course, also we have negotiation underway for a, for a treaty on business human rights. So uh, ECM is asking to all the speakers, do you think the legally binding treaty will change the situation, especially for the victims, given the fact that the treaty suggests an international funding for the victims and uh, would states like Turkey or Syria welcome the, the treaty? <clears throat> uh, um... I mean, I, uh, I can't, uh, yeah, um, uh, I can't offer, uh, I, I think always the inter an international treaty sounds like a good idea, uh, but um, I don't think that it's a, um, it's a realistic avenue um, to have that political will to, ha to establish an international treaty, um, especially, uh, when we see the role of AI and um, to accelerate innovation, so that's also an, uh, that's an that's at least an important point in the AI Act to have a robust framework, but to have that um, that uh, space to so that um, it can compete with other markets, such as like I would say US and China. Um, whether that was successful or not is another issue. Uh, I don't, I think, uh, I don't want to speculate. There, there was an attempt, and now I have to find it where, where uh, there, there was a, on the UN level to make a treaty on surveillance. I think there was, but like long time ago, and it, that, that failed because there was just not enough political will to do it. So in my opinion, well, like, yeah, I'm sorry if, the, if it's not a good answer, but I don't think that that's an avenue realistically that's going to happen in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Political will is always the, the problem. No? And um, Gayatri and Sidam, you would want to comment on, on this point? No, I share I share Daria's assessment that that a treaty takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of political will. Um, I'm not, and I don't know if it would ever happen or not happen. I, I don't want to predict um, what may or may not happen in the future. But what I would say is that perhaps um, our energies are better spent in ensuring that the existing um, tools that we have in international law are extended to applied, um, interpreted to apply to artificial intelligence and other technological development. And there's enough, there is enough documentation, there's enough documents, um, instruments, there are enough uh, resolutions and the UN uh, human rights, uh, the, the Bill of Human Rights itself provides a lot of guidance on what needs to and what shouldn't be happening. I would say the focus at the moment is perhaps better spent on A, ensuring that those international standards are um, achieved because those international standards are not the maximum. They are, they are anyway the bare minimum that we need to be hoping for. Um, we could of course build on that, but I think that is the minimum we need to be walking towards. First step would be that. Second step would be making sure that national regulations and regional regulations are compliant with international standards as using them as the bare minimum and, and hopefully they go further than that. I think if we do these two things, then we can hope for standard setting to happen at different places. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, see them. Yeah, yeah, from my perspective, I, I do second what Daria and Gayatri just said. Um, I, 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 
I don't find it appropriate to make a speculation about what's going to happen. We are not even sure this treaty will be finalized or even you know signed or ratified in the near future. But we know that there are national legal developments which which are very probably more effective. Um, will be more effective. We'll see, of course, they have to be, uh, I mean, I'm very curious about the impact of this EU directive and German law, uh, for example, uh, as for Turkey, it's going to be very impactful because Turkey is a very big trade partner of, of Germany. And uh, so that's something that we can analyze and talk about. Uh, but other than that, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, from a human rights perspective, I mean, as a as a human rights scholar, um, I I also agree with the fact that there are lots of uh, legal documents, instruments, conventions regulating all sorts of aspects of human rights. But the interpretation of those instruments may be reconsidered by the higher authorities, and they may extend to private actors, including companies, for example, maybe investment arbitrations, interpretation of bilateral investment treaties may change. And they may start consider human rights or social impacts of those foreign investments in different countries in the global south, or I don't know, Turkey seems like in the north, but let's also include that. <laughs> but yeah, that, that those may be changed. Uh, and we can speculate on that. It, 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 it will not be speculation, though. I think that will be a more meaningful discussion. That's that's what I think. I hope it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely, it, it makes sense. And uh, um, so, um, okay, just one last question we have from uh, Chipid about what assumption, if any, um, are you making now that will change as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the risk to trade global norms and uh, human rights. Also, we, we are like actually uh, the very first question from Gosego that was that we foresee or accept that the inclusion of human rights in business will trigger into trade in the WTO sense, you know. So, even if this is a bit of a broader, I guess, issue that what we are discussing artificial intelligence, but if you have any, any comment on, uh, on that. Not my expertise, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, we're moving into, into a bit of a different area, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I guess, yeah, no, I, I don't want to say anything wrong, but I guess the question would be how to, um, to um, uh, with regard to the BTO, um, um, establish to, um, so these obligations can be followed by all, um, um, all kinds of non-state actors in the um, in that value chain process and how how human rights compliance is dispersed in a equal way. But yeah, it's not my expertise. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, it's not a question of what has what assumption changed, but rather the assertion that we've been making that companies need to be more human rights compliant has become even more evident as a result of these developments. Um, so for instance, the, uh, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center sent out 200 odd surveys to companies to ask what steps they were taking in light of, uh, of, um, of those developments. And what is certainly clear to us is that companies' responses, um, however it is that we may see it, needs to be rooted in human rights and it needs to be rooted in human rights concerns. And there needs to be a metric, there needs to be a map or not star, so to say, to be able to base that um, the assessment on. So if anything, for me, this, 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 uh, th these unfortunate um, incidents have only further cemented the notion that businesses need to interact more, get more comfortable with human rights, and, and, and figure out a way to integrate it into the different processes. Thank you, Dinger. We have we have suggestion for like our next um, our next event on, <laughs> but um, since we have um, I guess just like the last ten minutes or so, I will I will just like to ask to um, to all the speakers uh, just an overall uh, issue as a sort of like closing 
statement. Um, so what, what do you think really today are the main challenges as well as the main opportunity if we apply a business human rights framework or, or the concept of human rights due diligence in the area of uh, artificial intelligence um, regulation? Yeah, uh, I think um, I think the the main challenge would be to um, to define these um, good ideas like human centric regulation into actionable processes, and to have an a uh, holistic and comprehensive approach to AI governance. Whilst, whilst not neglecting that, you also need um, sector specific uh, solutions um, and guidelines and technical specifications that need to work in tandem with a comprehensive framework and which is flexible enough to adapt to emerging technologies uh, and assess further uh, emerging and potential impacts on human rights. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, Daria. And uh, Gayatri or uh, Sida, any last comment? <laughs> I mean, in my mind, I feel that the biggest roadblock to, to any significant regulation on AI is going to be the amount of transparency and disclosures that are going to be needed from these, um, these big tech companies. And it's not only the big tech companies, because to a great extent, the data that's being used for AI is being processed by companies of different sizes. Um, so it's just the kind of disclosure that's needed and the human rights ramifications of that kind of disclosures themselves, I think that is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, and of course, the obvious thing is the willingness um, and the ability of the tech sector to, to, to embrace human rights. I would think that, uh, and then this was perhaps said in one of the earlier seminars of the, of the uh, council, I think that in the business and human rights discussions, the human rights circles and discussions, tech examples um, need to come up more, as, as was pointed out by an earlier speaker at the event I remember. If we do that, if we sort of bring in constant, if we normalize tech in the discussions of business and human rights, I think perhaps we'll be moving towards some sort of change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that point. And um, Sidam, over, over yeah. to you. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree with, with what Gayatri just said, that we have to normalize and make it more familiar for everyone, not for the global north, but for e everyone needs to be aware. Not everyone, but at least majority of states or lawyers in those states should be aware of the business and human rights concepts and including the companies and you know all, all other stakeholders um so because uh, in turkey for example um people are not aware of this business and human rights discourse it's very new and they immediately think that oh ethical codes and you know social audits but no human rights due diligence is different so we our organization is trying to support com companies and try being their critical ally uh, in, in meeting their human rights obligations, but they have to first understand that they have a responsibility, uh, which, uh, which they do not really um, see at the moment. Um, and uh, coming back to the AI regulation, even though my, my presentation today was on a different point, but I, I explored uh, some uh, AI related um, topics from a business and human rights perspective when I was writing my PhD thesis. And uh, as a lawyer, some concepts are very difficult uh, to illustrate. And I think we have to find a way to explain this, the AI, the, these technicalities of the AI to, um, to social scientists or to lawyers. So they will be more knowledgeable in holding companies accountable or asking for more transparency. They will know what to look at, uh, mm -hmm. how to look at, and what tools that they need. This is something that is still blurry for me. I, I read lots of books, even though they were all written in English. Uh, and majority of you know social scientists, they, they may not speak English, so we have to also make, make more accessible translations of those documents and courses uh, so that's 
some, you know, an insight uh, from my own experience. Yes, I, I, yeah, I think, uh, and um, especially like multidisciplinary engagement to assess the quality of technical safeguards, uh, because it's uh, what is very fascinating is that um, um, that these you need to consider a lot of viewpoints like lawyers, social scientists, human computer interaction, um, and also the, uh, computer scientists are working also more. Uh, to consider values of autonomy and interactive experience. So that dialogue to assess that quality of technical safeguards. Also, uh, when we also discuss data human rights impact assessments, it's becoming vital, yeah, for future governance. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, I mean, there are so many uh, interesting points here that I think there is, we will have probably like soon another, Another event or some uh, or some, or some project following following up and uh, um, so just so that again as uh, we are uh, uh, closing now this event like a huge thanks for uh, you know to to Daria Gayatri see them like you know they joining from uh, different parts of the world by like different time zones so um, it's been really so interesting like a great pleasure and of course to everybody in the in the audience. Uh, for attending again if you want to follow up anything you can contact us at Beagle also will be like recording available on our website and um, yes with that uh, um, again uh, thank you thank you all for uh, for your time today thank Thanks you for having us <laughs> yeah thank you bye bye bye, bye.